Daniels is our next presenter, and he's going to talk to you about the one thing that has the greatest impact on your health sleep. Lots of myths and misunderstandings, you know, get your eight hours, see you tomorrow. One of the major health pillars, very much the third or fourth health pillar. <laughs> They're a little bit hesitant to make changes. There's so many things that are happening in our lives right now that are beyond our control. One of the leading contributing causes of death and disability in industrialized countries is high blood pressure and its consequences, heart attacks and strokes. If I have anything, I try three days of fasting. And if it doesn't get better, I consider a treatment. Practical demonstration of, of what I want to share with you today, which is Work. Probably around, I would estimate me to be around 16 years old, and my mother had psoriasis, just a small amount on her elbows. Helps with inflammation, it helps with so many medical, there's so many medical benefits associated with cold exposure. We're going to begin with the first element, which is water. Today we're going to talk about memory. It's a very hot topic, and I am very passionate about helping people improve their memory and age healthfully, cognitively, physically, and socially. It is time to really get things started with our keynote. Bob began cello studies at the age of nine in the New York public school system and gave his first recital one year later. He entered the Juilliard Preparatory Division as a scholarship student and later enrolled in the Juilliard School where he received a bachelor's and a master of music degree. After graduating, Bob played chamber music full-time and served on the faculty of the University of Virginia until 1983, when he became a regular at the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra. He later joined the Baltimore Symphony and in 1985 became a member of the Philadelphia Orchestra. As an avid soloist and chamber musician, he has performed recital and appeared in major cities around the world. Bob is here to share with us his inspirational story of what happened in his life after receiving the news that he had multiple sclerosis. He will begin his story while playing his cello for us. Thank you. 
Thank you, Bob. That was beautiful. Thank you that so much. That was beautiful. Yeah. All right. So let me go ahead and pull your slide and turn things over to you. Okay. So I want to start off by thanking Ann and Trey. And uh, this was almost a non-event because uh, I received the email and it went into my spam folder. And uh I almost deleted it, and at the last second, I decided to look at it and realized it wasn't spam. So I'm so happy that that worked out well. And I want to thank Ann for all she does, and uh, Trey, and you know, it, it's all about taking charge of your own life and not depending on others to make decisions for you. So uh, just a little bit about my story. Uh, let's see. You know, I had just turned 40 and this is 1999 and i started experiencing a strange numbness in my left leg and i started limping at one point i sought uh, medical advice from a family doctor and an orthopedic surgeon they both surmised it was a pinched nerve and it was nothing to worry about and it seemed to clear up on its own. And then two months later, uh, February of 1999, I started losing peripheral vision in my left eye, which is the most bizarre experience. Um, you know, this is something you can describe to people, but it's something you would never know unless you experience what optic neuritis is. And this is essentially, it's an inflammation of the optic nerve. So you have the eye is the camera, the brain is the computer that interprets the image that is sent over the network called the optic nerve. It's a very complex nerve network, a million layers, and we just take it for granted that it will function perfectly all the time. And when this is inflamed, it's transmitting an incomplete picture, which an analogy would be a television set that's getting poor reception. So the eye is receiving, the eye is sending the signal and the brain is receiving an incomplete signal. So fine, I saw my first, uh, op I actually at that point I saw my first neurologist and he did an MRI of my brain and it was clean. There were no lesions, which is what you would look for in multiple sclerosis. And lesions are white spots that show up in an MRI. So he told me that I had multiple sclerosis, and I didn't want to believe this because he was, a neuro, he was an epilepsy specialist, and therefore he had to be wrong. So um, things progressed, and I decided to seek a second opinion. At that point, my brother-in-law, who worked for the NIH, set me up with uh, one of the three most esteemed neurologists in the country, and I saw him... He ran all kinds of tests. I went through the gauntlet of rheumatoid tests, everything you could think of. Lyme, heavy metal toxicity, um, was tested for AIDS, was tested for every, you know, every rheumatoid disease you could think of. Everything came back negative. And then they did an MRI of the neck and three lesions, three white spots showed up in the neck. And they weren't supposed to be there. And that became a definitive diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. So just to uh, fast forward now, I still didn't want to believe that this was the case, that I had this disease. So uh, in July of 1999, now I'm out to prove that I was misdiagnosed. I'm doing these monster bike rides in the hills of upstate New York in a 95 degree heat wave, I think it was. And my third attack came. I got uh, started with optic neuritis in the right eye. And then things went completely off the cliff for me. I wound up 
motion sick with no motion and I wound up being hospitalized for severe dehydration. So uh, if we could just back up one frame here. Yeah, so in April of 1999, this was the esteemed neurologist Fred Lublin, who's director of MS at Mount Sinai in New York. He put me on Avenex and he was sure of my diagnosis of MS. And this Avenex is a intramuscular injection weekly, a very big needle, and it's self-administered. And the side effects from this drug are so brutal, you have to take drugs to counter the side effects because the next day you have a case of the flu so bad that your hair hurts. So moving on to the next screen, uh, in 1999, I was hospitalized for severe dehydration, and this was my third and most brutal MS attack. And after I got out of the hospital, I could hardly move my hands, forget playing the cello, forget seeing. I could see silhouettes of people. I couldn't, I could hardly read. Everything was gone. I was incontinent. I was very shaky on my feet. I had no physical strength. Walking a half a block was like running a marathon. And I saw my fifth neurologist now because I had been neurology humping, uh, neurology, I had been jumping from neurologist to neurologist seeking my elusive misdiagnosis. So I saw Clyde Markowitz at the University of Pennsylvania, very esteemed neurologist, and I was so sick. And he ran a complete series of MRIs and at this point, my brain showed over 50 active lesions. It was all lit up like street lights. And if we can, you can see each one circled in red. This is just a, a quick summary of the 50. And then if we can go to the next screen, you can see the one in my spinal cord measured three and a half centimeters in length. And it looked almost like a blood clot and it took up the entire spinal cord which explained why I was so debilitated. I had lost the use of my hands. I could, you know, very shaky on my feet. Uh, you know, it affected my optic nerves. The MS had just in eight months progressed at a, a really rapid rate. And this was despite being on the Avenex for the previous four months. So uh, if we could move on to the next screen, I had seen Dr. Robert Surgat since February, and he was the, he is the director of neuro-ophthalmology at Will's Eye Hospital in Philadelphia, very esteemed neuro-ophthalmologist neuro and a very, very uh, respected establishment, the Will's Eye Hospital. And he had been monitoring my lack of progress over the six months I had seen him. And when I saw him after I got out of the hospital, he gave me a basic vision test and I couldn't even see the largest letters on the chart. And then he gave me what's called a visual field test to test your, your peripheral vision. And I failed miserably. I couldn't see anything. And at that point, he told me he'd write me a note for permanent disability. So here I am, a successful cellist. My life is just, I'm living this dream life. I'm in the world's greatest orchestra. I, you know, I give lessons, uh, everything is just going my way in life, and now everything is gone, permanent disability. So what do I do now, right? I sat in that chair, I remember to this day when he told me permanent disability, and I told him he could take his note for permanent disability and use it as a suppository because this was not happening. So if we could go to the next screen, accept the diagnosis, so finally, I'm accepting that this is not a misdiagnosis. This is a serious case of multiple sclerosis, but I decide to reject the prognosis. So what do I do here? I have no medical background. I have no training in science, biology, pharmacology, fitness, nutrition. I don't know anything. You hand me a cello, that's what I do. I can't do it. I can't even do that anymore. So how am I gonna find my own answers that medicine and neurology had overlooked? So let's move on to the next screen. There's a famous story here about a truck that gets stuck under an overpass and engineers are brought to the scene. 
and they're devising ways to raise the bridge or to dig grooves in the pavement to release this truck from its predicament. And a six-year-old boy comes along on his bicycle and he says, hey, mister, why don't you just let the air out of the tires? So it's funny that we live in a world where we live by the rules and you're not allowed to think outside of that box. But this six-year-old boy has not been educated with the rules that we live in yet. So he sees something that these experts had overlooked and it was right there in front of them. So I decided to take that mindset and regain my six-year-old mindset and find answers that these experts in medicine and pharmacology had overlooked. So what do I do? Let's move on to the next screen. I start my own research. I can hardly see, but I get this big giant monitor where I can sort of make out letters now. And I find this website called The Water Cure. And it's written by an Iranian doctor who passed away in the 90s. And he ran a study on Iranian prisoners with chronic illnesses. And what he did was he had them drink half their body weight in ounces of water a day. So for every pound, right, you drink half an ounce of water. So me at 160 pounds, that means I drink a minimum of 80 ounces of water a day. I was like, wow, this, this I could be onto something. Let's try this. It's no co-pays. I don't even have to drive to the drugstore. Let's try it. So I started drinking 80 ounces of water a day. And I was so sick, but at this point, I start to feel my first signs of improvement. And I'm so worried about getting hit with a fourth attack because they had progressed with intensity, the first three. So I start doing this and I start to feel my first signs of improvement. And I start to feel a little better. I see my strength starting to gradually return. And I said, okay, so I'm going to up the ante on this. And I start drinking two quarts of water every morning. So here we are. I'm drinking two quarts of water every morning. And I should notice this, that uh, you should know that when the neuro-ophthalmologist told me I'd be on permanent disability, I told him I was going to go back and rejoin the orchestra when the season started in September of 1999. He didn't believe it was possible, but... I was determined to do it. And I went back. I could hardly see. I could hardly move my hands. But I went back and I started. I rejoined the orchestra doing air cello. I wasn't able to play, but I faked it in, in one of the great orchestras of the world. I sat in the back with my own enlarged music, which I could hardly see. And I didn't quit. I just kept going. So let's move on. I started the water cure the next screen, and I started researching MS rates around the world. And I noticed Japan comes up as a country with a very, very low rate of MS as compared to other industrialized nations. And this got me looking at what do the Japanese do that the Americans don't do. And what's very different is the diet. Japan is a very, very crowded country, and you have nearly half the population of the United States crowded into a space the size of Wyoming. So they've got serious overcrowding. They've got serious pollution, but yet their life expectancy exceeds ours, and their quality of life is better as well. So what's the difference in the diet? If you look at the standard American diet, or SAD, as we call it, it's very high in things that are rarities in nature, salt, fat, and sugar. So you think of the average American diet, not just salt, fat, and sugar, but quantity. If you look at the amount of food that the Americans eat with each meal, we probably eat enough food for four or five people. So what happens when we overconsume calories? When we consume more calories than our body is able to burn, this, the body releases what are called their uh, unstable molecules. And this becomes, right, they're called, uh, what, what is it, unstable molecule or, um, anyway, so this becomes the seedbed for chronic illness. 
And if you look at the Japanese diet, it differs, right? It's not high in the salt, fat, and sugar, but it's very low quantities. It would be things like rice, small cuts of fish, vegetables. If they do eat meat, right, they don't eat a steak that hangs off the edge of the plate. They would eat cuts of meat with vegetables or cuts of fish with vegetables. Very different than what the Americans do. So I started looking at that, and then I stumbled onto the Okinawa centenarian study. And Okinawa is a prefecture in Japan, and it's considered the Shangri-La of the planet. And what they did was they studied over 900 people over the age of 100 from Okinawa. And these people were all in perfect health. And this is the famed Okinawa centenarian study. And if you look at what these people do, they only eat till they're 80% full. They live on basically an organic plant-based diet. If they do eat meat, chicken or fish, a very small amount, the size of a deck of cards and no more. And they only eat till they're 80% full. They don't eat till they can't breathe as most Americans do. So this got me thinking about what I'm gonna do here and another thing that really caught my attention was that on average, 67% of the diet in the Okinawa Centenarian study was comprised of organic Japanese sweet potatoes. So what do I need doctors in medicine for? I'm going to look at people who live to be over 100 and I'm going to do what they do. So basically, I canceled my membership in America's sad diet and I started living on a very simple plant-based organic diet. And I stopped eating meat, I stopped eating dairy. And the reason is dairy is really, it's uh, something of, of an anomaly. It's 75% of the planet doesn't drink milk and humans are the only species that drink another species milk. So I decided to stop eating dairy as well. And also I stopped eating meat and chicken and I limited my diet to wild caught fish. Okay. And uh, one thing that I probably did junk food was sushi because Japanese eat sushi and they don't have MS the way we do and they have a longer lifespan. So in addition to the research on that, I started looking at all experiences of my life. And in the 1980s, I went backpacking in Shenandoah National Park. And I was in the woods, I came out after three days and there was a sign, do not feed the deer. When you feed a deer human foods such as chips and candy, you reduce its lifespan by 30%. And here I was in perfect health back then, but this sign always stayed with me. And I always wondered, are we physically, physiologically that different than a deer that we can eat junk food, chips and candy and soda and smoke cigarettes and drink alcohol and expect no ill health effects from these habits? And what does a deer eat? A deer eats vegetation, probably some insects with those vegetation, and a deer drinks only water. A deer doesn't frequent McDonald's. It doesn't smoke fine Havana cigars and it doesn't drink fine Bordeaux wines. So, you know, if you ever see what a deer looks like, uh, I have, and the inside of a deer looks very different than the meat that they sold, sell in the supermarket because the meat is, you know, it's enhanced with growth hormones, with antibiotics, and it's laced with massive amounts of fat where a deer doesn't look anything like that. Under the hide of a deer is a small layer of fat, and then there's almost no fat in the muscles as well. So that was another thing that helped shape my diet. I was going to essentially live like a deer. I would drink only water, and I would, you know, eat a plant-based diet. Okay, but I held off on the insects. So let's move on to the next screen. So here I am. I'm on this drug, and I'm sick as a dog. And I decide one day I'm reading that packet insert that comes with the drug. You ever see those things? You unfold them and they go down to the floor. So I started reading this thing. And what I noticed was the clinical trial studies, right? Because you can't just sell a drug. Any drug has to go through 
FDA approval, and it's very strict. You have to go through these clinical trials. And part of a clinical trial is having a placebo group where they give the group a sugar pill or a water injection or something fake. And they tell people they're getting a new powerful drug and they see how these people react. And in every clinical trial, you get people in the placebo group that inexplicably improve, they get better. And how does this happen, right? If you look at Rogaine or Minoxidil, right? Rogaine is a hair, a hair growth drug for men. And when they did the clinical trial study, the placebo group, 18% of the men started growing hair where they didn't have it. And how do you explain this? So I looked at the Avonex drug I was on. And after two years on the drug, the success rate between the drug group and the placebo group was just about identical. And this stopped me in my tracks and got me really thinking about placebo studies. And I started looking at MS clinical trial studies. And you have this disproportionately high success rate in the placebo groups because MS is one of the most difficult drugs to come up with effective medication for because of this abnormally high success rate in the placebo groups. So what did I do here? I decide I'm going to learn the placebo group. I'm going to learn the placebo effect as a skill. And I did this by starting to meditate commands that my brain is healing. My brain is changing, finding new pathways to my muscles, that the MS is going into remission. The use of my hands is returning, right? Everything is that, you know, everything, my eyesight, my optic nerves are regenerating. My lesions are disappearing. They're vaporizing. And I started meditating and I started envisioning videos of these things happening that I wanted to see that my lesions were vaporizing. They were disappearing. My brain was finding plasticity, new pathways to the muscles that I was recovering the use of my hands. Everything was returning. So every day, and I started building my meditation sessions to two 30-minute sessions a day where I sat quietly and I repeated these healing commands to myself. So let's move on to the next screen here. And this constitutes my daily diet, essentially water which is my breakfast, right? And if you think of the amount of water that I'm consuming now, I'm drinking about two quarts of water in the morning. And what happens is there's so little room in my stomach for food that I'm not eating and I'm not hungry until probably one or two o'clock in the afternoon. So what am I doing here? I'm intermittently fasting every day without realizing I'm doing this. So every day I fast for probably 12 minimum to about 16 hours. And then I fast one day a week for about 36 hours. So we'll come back to this. But if you look at what I live on, it's basically an organic plant-based diet of nuts, seeds, uh, grains, which are a minimum because I try to eat more quinoa, which is a seed instead of a grain. And I eat organic fruits and vegetables. And again, uh, the only non uh, vegetation. The only animal food I eat is small amounts of wild caught fish. So uh, let's move on. Another thing I used was experiences all through my life, things I had, people I had studied, books I had read. How would these things help me? So people who accomplish the impossible, we move on to the next screen. And the first person that comes to mind is Roger Bannister. And he passed away, but at the age of 25, Roger Bannister became the first human being to do something that doctors and athletes said was impossible. And he ran a mile in under four minutes. And it was funny. He uh, ironically was a um, neuro He was a medical student. He became a neurologist of all people. And I was so lucky that I touched base with him before he passed away. And I sent him a copy of my book that I wrote. And there he is with it. But uh, that's just your prime example of someone who decides he's going to do something that's impossible. And once he broke that barrier, his record lasted for about two months. And then someone in Australia broke his record. And then you've had just this slew of people and you've had kids at the high school level run a mile in under four minutes. So something that was impossible now becomes an achievable skill. So 
let's move on. And if you look at, this is someone who I had read this book and I became fascinated with this way back before I was sick. And this is Nando Parado, who survived the famous 1972 plane crash in the Andes Mountains of South America in the winter. And what's pretty fascinating about this is Nando, when the plane crashed, it landed like a sled, like a toboggan, and it slid 2,000 feet down into a glacier, didn't hit any rocks. And then on the final deceleration is when all the damage was done, all the seats broke loose. Nando went flying forward from row nine into the bulkhead. His skull was fractured in four places. They thought he was dead and they put him in the cold with the bodies. And miraculously, Nando woke up three days later and no one could believe this guy was still alive with some of the survivors up there. And after 72 days, Nando showed up in the foothills of the mountains. This guy had gone 37 and a half miles through the, one of the world's most difficult mountain ranges. And he had no equipment. He had never seen snow. He had no boots, no ropes, no ice axe, no tent, and no food. And the only source of food he had was just this gruesome prospect of the people who had perished in the crash. So Nando was so amazing and mountain climbing teams that reconstructed his route later on said what this guy did was impossible. So what Nando has is he has the ability of his brain to supersede the limits of the human body. So let's move on to somebody else that did something that was impossible was Bobby Fischer. Yeah, he was a misogynist. He was an anti-Semite. He was legitimately crazy. But he was amazing that he set this goal out for himself to do something impossible. And that was to take the title from the Russians, the chess title, the world title. And he did this in 1972 by himself. And he didn't just beat the grandmaster who was the world champion, Boris Spassky. He beat an entire nation, an entire culture, because the Soviet Union had devoted everything and anything into keeping that title in world hands. And here this kid from New York, Bobby Fischer, does it on his own. And he didn't just do it. He did it in style. He was so amazing. And if you study his games, his approach was not to the game of chess. This was a life and death approach. This was his fight for survival. And he was not going to lose this fight. So in my mind, I became Nando Parado. I became Bobby Fischer. I was going to do something impossible. Someone else here, Nolan Ryan, who everyone knows, the great fastballer. He was the first person to be clocked throwing a baseball over 100 miles an hour. And what's more amazing than that is he did this for 27 seasons. And at the age of 44, he threw his seventh no-hitter. And he struck out over 5,000 batters in his lifetime. And at the age of 46, when he retired, his last pitch was clocked at 98 miles per hour. And what did he do that was impossible? He staved off the aging of his body for 25 years. So in his mid-40, he was essentially 20 years old. So what did I do? I got his book, Nolan Ryan's Pitcher's Bible, and I emulated his lifestyle. I read what he said about diet. I started doing his exercise regimen of yoga-based exercise, lifting weights, everything else. So that's the way I live. I live like a professional athlete, and my big game is tomorrow. So let's move on. And this is how I do. Every day I start with yoga. Right? And I do handstands. I do weightlifting, a la Nolan Ryan. I do chin-ups, and I'm on the bike every day. I do cycling. Why? Because cycling is such an incredible exercise that it strengthens the body. It's cardio exercise. It exercises the central nervous system with reflex, judgment, timing, everything. So that's why I feel cycling is such an important part of my daily regimen. And also meditation that I keep my mind sharp with meditation, okay? So moving on to the next screen here. After, when I met Nando, it was April 15th of 2013, 
And I hadn't been to a doctor in 11 years. I hadn't gone back to a neurologist and I hadn't seen my neuro ophthalmologist in 14 years. And why did I do this? Because I felt that their help was not helpful for me, that here I had done the standard protocol treatment for multiple sclerosis, right? When you're diagnosed with MS, you go to a neurologist, he tells you you have MS. You say, what do I do now? The standard procedure is they say, well, here's the latest six-figure drug. You take this drug, come back and see me in a month or two. What do I do now? I don't know. We'll hope the drug works and we'll see you soon. For me, that obviously wasn't good enough. So when I met Nando, something went through me because I said to him, I always wanted to meet you and thank you because you were my guide when I was stranded on the mountain and my life was over. And I looked to you for guidance and inspiration. And he gave me this hug. And at that moment, I, I somehow had felt I had cured myself, but I had no definitive proof of this. So I went back to my neurologist at UPenn after 11 years, and he ran a complete series of MRIs. And you can see here, my spinal cord is completely clear. And if we move on to the next picture, these are very similar, very similar images of what you saw with those all those lesions, you can see the brain is showing no traces of lesions. So this is what I had envisioned when I did my meditation. And this was the result I achieved now in definitive form here. So uh, let's move on to the next screen here. And this is Dr. Robert Surgat, who told me that I would be on permanent disability. And when I saw him 14 years later, he was astounded looking at the MRIs, which I showed him of the before and after. And he said he had never seen anybody come back from where I was. That's how sick I was. And his diagnosis of a permanent disability was something he stood by because it made sense. So I did a book signing in 2016 and Robert Surgat was invited as this featured speaker and he gave his opinion on how I changed my immune system. And it was very interesting to hear from a medical perspective. He thought number one, by switching to an organic plant-based diet, I had changed the microbiome in my gut and that changed my immune system. And then he felt that I was doing all this cycling outside to rebuild my body he, he deemed that I've been getting these high levels of vitamin D. Therefore, I'm changing my immune system because of the correlation between low levels of vitamin D and high levels of multiple sclerosis. So moving on to the next screen, this got me thinking, what else was I doing that could have possibly changed my immune system? And without realizing I'm fasting. And what happens when you fast? When you eat food, your body produces insulin, which changes these the sugars, the glucose into energy, and your body uses that. And what's not used is stored, namely in your fat cells. And the human body is designed to go days without food. And the problem is we don't eat because we're hungry. We eat because it's time to eat. And we never use what's in storage. And we keep amassing, amassing storage, storage, storage. And that leads to obesity, high levels of sugar, diabetes, all kinds of chronic illnesses set in because we have too many reserves in our system, right? So when you're fasting, you are doing what the body was designed to do. You are using the reserves that, that were meant to be used. So the other thing I was doing was I was exposing my body to cold. And that's a picture of Wim Hof. He's the famous Iceman who regulates his body temperature with his mind. He swims in Arctic waters. He set all these records for exposure to cold. So here, I'm so worried about getting hit with my fourth attack, I start taking cold showers every day. So here, I'm cycling in really cold weather with a minimum of clothing because I'm worried about overheating my body and I'm taking cold showers every day. So I'm following the Iceman and the human body was meant to adapt to different temperatures Everything we do today is 75 degrees, the car, work, the house. We lose our ability for adaptation. We compromise the immune system. So I've rediscovered and I've changed my immune system in these areas as well. So moving on to the next screen, 
This is Dr. Terry Walls, who's the guru in the MS world, medical doctor. She was wheelchair bound for four years, and she basically comes up with this whole diet, this system of reversing MS, which turned out to be very similar to what I did. Her book came out 14 years after I was diagnosed, and I didn't know about her. She contacted me. She asked me to come and speak at her seminar, and she was fascinated by my story. She asked me to do a handstand for her, so that's what I'm doing there, and I do that every day. So at the age of 62, I'm probably in better physical condition than I was at 20. So moving on, I do this every year. Uh, I didn't do it last year because we didn't go, but the orchestra goes to Vail, Colorado, and I bike from Vail Village up to Vail Pass. It's about 17 miles. It's a 2,500-foot vertical climb. You've got to be in good physical condition to do this. To be 60 years old with MS is something of science fiction. So I do this every year, and... It's amazing that I've recovered and I've rebuilt my body completely. So uh, I think that's about it. Isn't that the last one? And also there, if you're interested in my book, it's available on the website, uh, bobcafaro.com. You can get a signed copy or you can download it on Kindle. And also I do one-on-one -on -one consultations with people, an analysis of lifestyle and it's been, you know, I've had very good luck and I've had great success with quite a few people with that. So. Awesome, Bob. So inspirational. So amazing. And you highlight everything. All the speakers that are coming up today that are going to teach everyone those techniques that you yourself self-taught your and discovered. And as, I'm going to check real quick if anyone has any questions for Bob before we before we let him go. You can see in the chat there's a call to action. You can click through, get to his website buy his book, share his information with others, anyone that you know that is suffering from a chronic disease, whether it's really MS or any any other type, uh, you know, to get in touch with Bob, to hear his story and get the inspiration from him, the, the changes and everything that, that, that he did uh, to get his life, his health. And like he said, he's in his 60s and in better health than he was in his 20s. So that is something that all of us can be doing right now. Uh, Ralph asked, could this apply to Parkinson's, the changes that you've made? Again, I'm not a doctor. I have no medical background at all. But I can say this with authority that a healthy lifestyle and changes in your lifestyle will benefit everyone no matter what your health situation is. So the human body will thank you to some point with a healthy lifestyle change. As far as that, my knowledge of Parkinson's is limited. So, you know, and again, I'm not shunning Western medicine. I'm saying that, you know, I, 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 my approach was to stack the deck in, the favor from, in my favor from every angle. Western medicine, that one particular Avenex didn't help me, but lifestyle did. And people should know I'm off all medications since September of 2003. But I do take vitamin D3 now, and that's because my wife runs a clinical trial study for COVID-19. She says, you're taking vitamin D3. So that's the only thing I take. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, Ralph, this session is streaming live on YouTube, and it will, uh, after we're done today, I will be cutting each and every session and posting them on the 365 First YouTube channel. So that will be, his session will be available for everyone to uh, share and rewatch again. Absolutely. All right, Bob, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate it. We're at the top of the hour and I'm going to wait for my next speaker to come in. If you, can you play for us just a little bit again? Maybe I would I'm love gonna, that. I'm this is the first thing that I tried to play after I got out of the hospital and I couldn't move my hands and it was a disaster. So now I can play it. So you'll hear the difference. <laughs> Thank you. 
Beautiful. We're so blessed to have had you today and so blessed to still have you in the world playing and teaching and passing on your talent. Thank you so much, Bob. And, and thank you so much for all you do. I am so inspired by your whole approach and people taking charge of their lives. And thank you again for reaching out to me. It was an honor to be featured as the key, keynote speaker today. And I, I cannot thank you enough, Anne. Thank you.